this time, standing up for everyone else. Tonight's rewrite, income inequality. And the first thing we have to do to discuss this subject is rewrite that phrase, income inequality. Economists know what they mean when they say it, but too many civilians don't. The truth is there will never be equality in this world. It's impossible, an opium-laced dream. And that is the perfect example of the problem with the phrase income inequality. Some people who haven't spent enough time in economics classes seem to think that the alternative to income inequality is income equality. And no one is suggesting that we should have income equality. So let's use the more descriptive phrase income distribution. There is an important new entry in the debate about income distribution in this country. It is an economic research report, so it does use the phrase income inequality in its title because it correctly assumes that everyone who's going to read this report understands it and it understands that it is not advocating income equality. The report comes straight out of Wall Street, deep in the belly of the beast. And so you can assume that the report says there's nothing wrong with this picture. The line at the top is what's happened to the top 1% of income earners in this country since 1979. They have captured an ever larger share of our national income. Here's how President Obama describes that picture. Since 1979, when I graduated from high school, our productivity is up by more than 90 percent. But the income of the typical family has increased by less than 8 percent. Whereas in the past, the average CEO made about 20 to 30 times the income of the average worker. Today's CEO now makes 273 times more. And meanwhile, the family in the top 1 percent has a net worth 288 times higher than the typical family, which is a record for this country. Wall Street has produced more of the sharp spikes in income distribution than any other industry in this country. Wall Street jobs that used to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in 1979 now pay millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, and hundreds of millions of dollars. So no one working on Wall Street is going to see anything wrong with this picture, right? Who on Wall Street would worry about what they see in this picture? Anyone who wants the rich to get richer should actually worry about what they see in this picture. And that worry is clearly expressed in this new report I've been referring to. It's from Standard & Poor's Global Credit Portal entitled, How Increasing Income Inequality is Dampening U.S. Economic Growth and Possible Ways to Change the Tide. This is an unemotional document. This report doesn't care about fairness. This report does not make a moral case about income distribution. This report doesn't ask the question, is our income distribution fair? Instead, it asks this, would the U.S. economy be better off with a narrower income gap? And if an unequal distribution of income hinders growth, which solutions could do more harm than good and which could make the economic pie bigger for all? To the question of would the U.S. economy be better off with a narrower income gap, this Standard & Poor's report says, in a word, yes. The report agrees with what President Obama told Joe the plumber in 2008. My attitude is that if the, if the economy is good for folks from the bottom up, it's going to be good for everybody. If you've got a plumbing business, uh, you're going to be better off if you've got a whole bunch of customers who can afford to hire you. And right now, everybody's so pinched that business is bad for everybody. And, and I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. Here's how the Standard & Poor's report says what you just heard President Obama say. We see a narrowing of current income of the current income gap as beneficial to the economy. In addition to strengthening the quality of economic expansions, bringing levels of income inequality under control would improve U.S. economic resilience in the face of potential risks to growth. From a consumer perspective, benefits would extend across income levels, boosting purchasing power among those in the middle and lower levels of the pay scale while the richest Americans would enjoy 
increased spending power in a sustained economic expansion. See, nothing's changed. Wall Street is still looking out for the rich guy. But in this report, the best way to look out for the rich guy is to look out for the little guy at the same time and everyone in between. It's counterintuitive, but income inequality is hurting the rich in the long run, too. At extreme levels, income inequality can harm sustained economic growth over long periods. The U.S. is approaching that threshold. Standard & Poor's sees extreme income inequality as a drag on long-run economic growth. We've reduced our 10-year U.S. growth forecast to a 2.5% rate. We expected 2.8% five years ago. Spending is the fuel for economic growth. And if you literally have more money than you know what to do with, then that money is not going to be pumped back into the economy as spending. If you have all the houses you think you need and all the yachts you think you need and all the private planes you think you need and you still have tens of millions of dollars left over and tens of millions of dollars in new income coming in next year, then very little of your new income is going to be used for new spending. And the economy always needs new spending. And in the lower half of the income scale where people have no savings and not enough money to make ends meet, they have to cut back on their spending. Long term, those two conditions can strangle the economy. People with increasing amounts of money that they can't possibly think of ways to spend and people with not enough money who have to cut back on their spending. And a strangled economy is bad for everyone, including the super rich. That's what the Standard & Poor's report is alerting Wall Street about. Worrying about income inequality is now way too important to be left to the liberals, according to this Wall Street report. Do you suggest that anyone who questions the policies and practices of Wall Street and financial institutions, anyone who has questions about the distribution of wealth and power in this country, is envious? Is it about jealousy or is it about fairness? Uh, you know, I, I think it's about envy. I think it's about class warfare. Standard & Poor's is not envious of great wealth in this country. Standard & Poor's is in the business of helping supply the building blocks of great wealth. This Standard & Poor's report is a breakthrough in the debate over income distribution in this country. It has the power to change some minds on the subject because it doesn't come from a political party and most importantly, it rewrites the terms of the debate because it doesn't mount a moral argument that absolutely will not be heard by people whose minds are closed to such arguments. Instead, it makes its case based on the most elemental incentive in classical, which is to say conservative economic theory, self-interest. What is helpful to you getting richer is their question. And the report's answer is what is helpful to you getting richer is everyone getting richer. Something that should not take a lot of economics classes to understand. The Standard & Poor's report concludes with this. The challenge now is to find a path toward more sustainable growth, an essential part of which, in our view, is pulling more Americans out of poverty and bolstering the purchasing power of the middle class. A rising tide lifts all boats, but a lifeboat carrying a few, surrounded by many treading water, risks capsizing. Standard & Poor's, once again, standing up for the rich guy, and this time, standing up for everyone else.